Hello, thrilling suspense fanatics. Today's story is exceptionally dark. It's a tale from Oriental stories, which, like all of the stories in Oriental stories, has uh, tinges of Orientalism and problematic racial aspects. But those aside, this story is also a story about an extremely exploitative father, about a girl who is 15 and involved in the sex trade, so be warned. That said, she is the protagonist. She has agency. Nobody saves her or does it for her. She's got this. Let's get into it. The Dancer of Jogyakarta by Warren Hastings Miller the story of a lovely Javanese maiden who called the elder gods of the Hindus to aid her escape from the lust of white men who coveted her body. Nana Kuching's attitude towards her own Javanese was that of the eternal mother, deep-rooted in every woman. Men were foolish and perverse, but children, if skillfully managed. She was the dancer of Jogya, childish in face and figure, but very much the Javanese woman. Her men were to admire and obey, to be led about by the nose. White men were different. She detested them all as embodiments of the worst that is in us. It was small consolation to reflect that her lapses of virtue, albeit with them only, filled the need for a wife and a sweetheart in these white men, who were lonely in this distant part of Java. Occasionally, not often, there had been words of appreciation that, in incoherent murmurs, hints from very maudlin and sentimental white twans who had dealings with her, generally it was all mere barter and sale, filling her soul with disgust. Occasionally, not often, there was an expression in their eyes, like to this present young white twan who sat on a pillow before her house veranda watching her dance. Nana had seen before that expression, an incredulous amazement in his eyes that this mere child, with the delicate oval face and drooping baby mouth with no visible eyebrows and finely modeled infantile Javanese nose, this picture of innocence dancing before him, should be in reality a grown woman complacent to his hand. The young white twan was tall and slender and handsome, with wavy brown hair, brushed back over a sunburned forehead, his blue eyes with their puzzled expression of wonderment studying the art of her dance under raised brown eyebrows. His bow-curved mouth was compressed under the small and close mustache such as the Ingress Twans wore. He was no fat and beery Hollander, those bearded beasts whose reachy kisses had filled her soul with loathing. Yet she hated him vaguely, hated still more Tidak Prahu, the guide who had brought him here for the commission her father paid him. She was aware of that rabbit's presence, squatting behind his twan, but she bestowed on them all not a glance, concentrating her mind on the graceful steps of the rongeng, which is the court dance supposed to be performed exclusively before his highness, the sultan of Jogya. Besides that expression of troubled incredulity that sat on her twan's face, there was recognition there, too. Nana thought that out as she danced before him on the rude bamboo platform of the veranda of her kampong. She was now simply clad in a plain blue sarong and an embroidered white bodice which covered her bosom, with no adornment save a long and soft silken shawl, or slendang, which left her arms and shoulders bare and served as a sort of wings to heighten the poses of her dance. But he was evidently recognizing her as that resplendent and supposedly impeccable court dancer in the flowing gold-embroidered sarong and tight bodice of gold lace straps who had performed only the night before at the sultan's court. Yes, she was the same girl, a court dancer forbidden to all men, Add spice to your adventure, doesn't it, young white twan, teased Nana with her eyes as she swung and pirouetted gaily through the measures, intent on her difficult dance. A discordant thump of the strings of the bamboo lyre played by her father, who squatted at the right of the platform, recalled her to her duty to her parent. 
the drummer at her left, dubbing at a long double-ended drum with the tattoo of his fingers, broke into a more vigorous and syncopated time. A scowling glance met her from the monkey face of old Sapit Kuching, the parent who owned her and lived by her sacrifices. It was necessary to pay less attention to the technique of her dance now. He was commanding to put more seduction and direct invitation into it to this young white twan seated admiringly before her. Nana exercised her charms obediently. Her eyes concentrated on his, her arms swayed seductively, her body moved provocatively. How she hated this part! Really, Nana thought, as she addressed herself to him, managing all these men, her father who lived on her and who had many beatings for her if she did not do her part, these white twans who bought her for an evening, this whole hateful league of men against her, they were almost too much for the eternal mother instinct in a girl of fifteen. It was all gross and unfair and cruel. There was the sultan, too, who had more than once hinted that she might become one of his retinue, but, above all, there was the young prince Yusuf Sengang, who really loved her, who came courting after fowls take their perches time, but who could not get his uncle's permission to marry her. Really it required a deal of managing. Might Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, show her the way out? thought Nana, as she went on with this hateful business of captivating the white tuan. There was irresolution in his eyes now, then the challenge of the primal male in him. Why, yes, if the lady made advances, it was for him to be gallant. It was at least better, this reluctance, than the usual lascivious hunger with which gross and bearded Hollanders or dark and oily Portuguese came here, but she hated him none the less. Others were watching him too, and from the musicians shot out of nowhere, in particular the usual wadded-up note, to fall in a curve into his lap. Nana knew what it contained, a scrawl in Javanese English appointing him to meet her that night at ten in the familiar old Hindu shrine back in a secluded part of the sultan's gardens. Nana watched him surreptitiously open the note while the natives grinned. A flush spread over his features. A glance of lowered respect, somewhat stern, then a nod of acquiescence. A spasm of loathing attacked her. How long, O oh Allah, protector of the innocent, how long? Nana retired to her room for a good fit of weeping after the musicians had gone to the men's rooms of her kampong and the white twan had departed in tow of that scoundrel Tidak Prahu. She rose from her couch about five o'clock and put on the resplendent court dress. A final look in the mirror before calling her Ebro or tilt carriage for the evening's drive. It was the face of a child that was reflected there, not a wrinkle or a line, the kind of innocent face she had seen on white Mem Sahib children, girls of twelve, delicate, almost invisible arched eyebrows on the smooth brown forehead, scanty black hair done smoothly back so as to bring out the childish contours of head and neck, no visible ears. Soft and warm brown almond-shaped eyes, eyes not narrow or oblique, as with the Chinese, but wide and disdainful. She was born men's hearts to snare, born, if the world had consulted her about it, to trample on all men with cool aloofness. All save one. For him were the depths of those eyes. In the name of Allah, when all she wanted of life was Yusuf and a little brown baby that would be something of them both. And, because of her father and the sultan, this. She hated particularly white men, for they forced her to forego her reserve, that precious reluctance of womankind without which the world would be in chaos. If women were to take the initiative, eager, compelling, as men did, Nana had very definite ideas as to just how far a girl should go, a dainty and delicate coquetry, a reserved display of her charms, half-daring, half-shy flirtations. Beyond that the thing became distasteful, men's province. But to be forced out of the protection of these instincts, to become bold and seductive, of a wanton brazenness, ugh! An old crone, a slave of her father's, set out tiffin for her on a flat bamboo table, and laid a cushion before it on the floor. 
Nana partook moodily. Tonight, again, she knew how Yusuf felt about it. To the Javanese youth it was all very simple. She was innocent in his eyes, since these affairs with the white tuans were none of her seeking. Once they were married, all that would be of the past, and he would look only for faithfulness to him forever. The thing must be managed somehow. This young white tuan must be her last, and there must be no christening him, as Yusuf would want either. She drove out through the palm-shaded roads, past the desas or native Javanese villages which bordered it on every side. In Jogya town, many were the salams and friendly greetings from the deposed Mataram nobility, proud and poor, dependent as was Prince Yusuf Sengang himself, solely on the sultan's bounty, now that the Dutch government had shorn both him and them of their temporal power. Nana was well known to them all, a great favorite at court. None of them knew of these private affairs of hers with the whites, arranged at her own home and consummated in the old Hindu shrine in the sultan's gardens. The imposing ruins of Prambanam temples came into sight. Nana had the true Mohammedan's concept for Hindu idols and human figures carved against the express command of Allah, the one true God. She yawned and eyed disdainfully the bas-relief friezes on Prambanam, picturing incidents from the Mahabharata. She gaped at the Shivas and Kalas and the Ganeshas, seated in their shrines. She had no conception of the vast antiquity of these gods, nor of their still potent influence on the human race. To her they were but foolish labors of foolish men, set up stone upon stone into vast temples, stone god after stone god, hoisted into niches some thousand years ago, only to be swept into oblivion by the advancing armies of the one true god. That Shiva was hoary with venerable antiquity when her Mahomet was born, that while Brahm dreams the gods die not, these were verities that had never entered her mind, yet, and yet. She began to grow reflective as the carriage slowly paced around through the maze of temples, and she studied now the squatting stone figures, each and all marked with that impenetrable and enigmatic smile of Asia. What was the secret locked in those stone lips? What did the gods know that man did not know? She eyed them finally with yearning disquietude. Had they, after all, something for her, something that the later prophets had missed? Surely there was something wrong with the Quran's prophets of Allah that they had no solutions for her and her problem. Her Mahomet had nothing but very strict and sharply defined instructions as to women of her profession. A dancing girl was a dancing girl, also a courtesan, and she was to bear no children or be stoned with stones. There was another, Nana had heard of him once, from a very drunk and maudlin sub-lieutenant of police who had simply said, Woman, go and sin no more. All very easy to say, but what if one had a father who owned a palm mid-rib whip in which there were many beatings, and a lover willing to rescue her but whose whole life was bound about by the sultan's bounty? But the elder gods knew none of these things, nor cared. Serene and enigmatical, they sat in their shrines, stone gray with the centuries, the ageless smile of Asia on their faces, the smile of that supreme wisdom born of indifference. Worship us or do not worship us. It is all one. Ye are men, and ye make your own gods, some to pull down and destroy, others to elevate for a little. But to us ye come in the end, their expression hinted. A four-faced Brahm sat dreaming out of the topmost pinnacle of Prambanam, looking always, seeing all, indifferent, biding his time. I am Brahm, the universe, the known and the unknown, he seemed to whisper into Nana's vague fancies. All the creeds, the doubts, and the thoughts of man are me. The earth, the stars, and all life that on them is are one with me. The gods are me. Follow whom ye will, to me ye return, for I am him whom ye follow. Yearning, eager questionings filled Nana's whole being as she halted her Ebro and sat studying the impassive face of the Brahm so far above her. O oh, Brahm, what hast thou for me? she implored with her baby lips. 
Surely there was a hidden truth in these elder gods, these beings forgotten and neglected of the present generation. They would not fail her as Mahomet had done. One and all, for they were but different manifestations of the Brahm, surely these elder ones had a message for her, or none had. There was something here, if she could only think down into it, those wise, all-knowing, all-concealing faces. And their message came at length into her soul. Man, woman, your world is within you alone. We gave you life, it is yours. What you do with it, what you think, is yours to say and no one else. Ye are foolish who lean on this and that God, for they were born but yesterday, and tomorrow will be gone, and their mouths stopped with dust. But we who are life, we remain. Woman, arise and take. Thou alone hast domination over thy soul." Nana Kuching drove back to Jogya a changed girl. She was done with Mahomet, for a mightier than he had spoken to her, the Brahma of Prambanam. She was only a dancing girl, as her Javanese world viewed her, but she was more than that now, a dominant and determined woman's soul, freed from false convention, determined to mold her life and those around her henceforward by her will. It could and would be done, if she had the courage to do it. The elder gods knew life. All that had come after them was futile piffle, lies, and would soon vanish and men return to them, while Brahm dreams. Prince Yusuf could take her or leave her that night, she had decided. As for the white tuan, a scornful smile tinged her lips. All the insults to her helpless person were to be revenged upon him that night. No crissing or anything violent like that which her woman's soul abhorred, but a thing humiliating, arousing the laughter of the very gods, a soul-satisfying and complete woman's revenge on them all. The broad and obscene Malay sense of humor quivered on her lip as she thought over the possible retributions and finally came to a climax in a shrill trill of childish laughter. This white twan would that there were more of them, the more detestable ones of odious memories to witness and learn. The iron scenery of this part of Java strengthened her resolution as she drove back. Great bare and rock-ribbed cones of volcanoes, some extinct, some inactive, a few, Bromo, Tassari, and his fellows on the far horizon, arose clouded with fumes of smoke and shreds of vapor in the clear blue of twilight. She would do it. She was woman, the manager. These men, all of them, brown and white, were but naughty children to be spanked or to be led where she would. There was no sign of this inward revolt as she entered the thatch-roof kampong and flung herself idly on the mat to await Yusuf Sengang. A little garden of papayas and bougainvillea gave on her window, flanking it, two huge and slatting bananas. Fireflies were illuminating the night outside, winking in myriad twinkles of light in the great waringen trees which overshadowed the sultan's gardens. Presently, there was a soft calling of her name, and a slender brown hand pushed over the window. It bore a rope of pearls, which Nana took with little soft cries of delight over the beauty of the lovely things. "'I, Nana, my all to purchase these things,' whispered Prince Yusuf's voice. His turbaned head appeared over the bamboo railing. There were soft love words spoken in whispers, the sedate and discreet Malay courtship. He was a slender youth, seemingly as much a boy as she was a girl. There was no maturity visible in his face, yet it was there, the placid and unruffled maturity that looks on life with a right sense of its proportions and meets its onslaughts with the keen temper of a welded Malay blade. He was a good deal more of a man than he looked, this Prince Yusuf, in his resplendent and somewhat effeminate court dress. Nana listened a while to the familiar endearments, enjoying them while she might, for no one could foresee the outcome of the step she was about to take. "'Enough, Yusuf, my prince and my lord,' she interrupted him. "'When do we go before the sultan's haji to be married?' Yusuf waved his hands despondently. "'Thou knowest, light of Java, I am utterly dependent upon my uncle. When the sultan says, 
and I am not dependent, Yusuf. Dear as thou art to me, this night we go, or never. The youth's almond eyes suddenly darkened. Nana knew that expression well, the sudden malay rage, ferocity. He had put his all into this gift for her, and to be treated thus. Then it softened to love and admiration again. Hi, my queen of dancers, a brave flash of spirit, but of no avail. What would you? Take me or leave me, dream of my eyes, purred Nana softly. Out into the world I go to-night, here are back thy pearls, yet do I love thee. But I have nothing. Where can we go, where? wailed Yusuf. All his comfortable world of the sultan's court suddenly stricken from under his feet. Life without the prospect of Nana, however dimly in the future, but none the less a certainty to the timeless east, blankness, misery. I would die without thee, Pearl of Java, he murmured. Speak not of going, we must wait, all will come in time. Are not two who love enough for life? asked Nana. Two to raise the rice, to wield the parang that a home may be built? Is not the whole wide preanger open to us? There we can find peace, these gewgaws holding up the pearls. And others that thou and I possess will buy land enough. For seed rice there is the Dessa bank, and coolies to plant it. Let us live and not wait, my prince. Yusuf was immeasurably shocked. What had come over Nana, the meek and submissive Mohammedan girl? But he hid it under the usual impassive Malay mask. He was also much perturbed for himself, to forego his position and his cherished nobility at the sultan's court, to incur the old despot's sure displeasure, and all for this beautiful dancing girl who had affairs with white twans. He took refuge in his religion, as most men do when they wish to coerce women. And what does the Quran say about young couples who flaunt their sultan and disobey their fathers to run off into unknown principalities? he asked. The preanger was just over the border. The Quran be damned, exclaimed Nana, in as near an approach to that vigorous Anglo-Saxon expression as the soft and courteous Malay speech permits. Yusuf stood aghast. Blasphemy! The woman was mad. He gaped at her open-mouthed. O oh, Yusuf, our gods are but of yesterday, and those who made them scarce cold in their graves. Nana drove on at him relentlessly. What do they know of life? Have we not asked Mahomet in our prayers, and has he anything to say? She inquired scornfully. Not but to endure and obey. Pish! I have talked with the elder gods, Yusuf, my prince. They know. When two meet at twilight in the young rice, there they give life. All else is rubbish, the dreams of men. You have talked with them, the sacrilegious idols on the prambanam, carved in defiance of the prophet? quavered Yusuf, his religion also knocked from under him by this new and not submissive Nana. Yea, they talk to me. To them we return in the end. The rest is lies. Tonight I go, dearest prince, and thou goest with me, she insisted. What stops us? The commands of the Quran, say you? They are lies, misery, striking down hope and love. Such things be lies. Money, position, they are not. We have enough. Sell these baubles and come, my prince. Yusuf hesitated, eyeing with dawning approval and admiration this confident and courageous Nana, who had dared to put her finger upon the bonds which held them both, and who dared, further, to brush them magnificently aside. He was half one to do and dare himself. They would be complications, the sultan's displeasure beginning life anew as a simple landowner in a new province, but the Dutch government would see that he had no actual interference from Jagyakarta, no hailing them back, no imprisonment. They were free to go where they liked under the white man's law. They had money enough to start, too. The jeweler who lived near the residency would see to that, show him pearls enough. She was right. This way led life. One thing alone troubled him. You have come by no affliction by these white twans, he asked her simply and directly. "'Allah be praised, no!' exclaimed Nana, most inconsistently in view of what she had just said about the elder gods. 
it was not lost on Yusuf. She was still a devout Mohammedan, with reservations which need not be known except to them too. It mattered a good deal over in the Prianger, which was quite as devout Muslim as Jogya. It would not do for her to proclaim the elder gods there openly. And that reminds me, went on Nana, there is a Tuan coming to the shrine in the Sultan's gardens this night, a young and handsome Tuan, new to Java, I think. His eyes were troubled over me when I was dancing before him this afternoon, yet he will come, like them all. But I would be revenged on them all through him, my prince. Yusuf laid hand on Chris and scowled. Say but the word, flower of Jogya, he gritted through clenched teeth. Who always something violent, you men, caroled Nana softly. Think how that would ruin everything and bring down the wrath of the company upon us all, in that you had slain a white tuan. But there is a pond in the Sultan's gardens, a fish pond, full of ugly squat frogs and great water lilies. Nana meant these huge Victoria regias, the Sultan's pride, with round flat leaves a yard across and a vile slime and a stench arises from it when the coolies do wade in there to pluck the lotus flowers, this tuan will come to me at the shrine at ten knocks. As white men count time, he will speak soft and false words of love, and then will seize me. She shuddered, while again Yusuf laid hand on Chris. Then, my prince, I would that, when I cry out, Jaga! Four strong coolies seize that white man in all his spotless linens with the pearl buttons upon the white jacket of him. Nana's shapely hands made vigorous pantomimes. Then thou and I will go quickly. Yusuf began to grin. His broad Malay humor was tickled at the vision of that sacred white twan being thus dealt with. He burst into an uproarious laugh, then stifled it with a sigh. Hoy, these evil times! he said, fondling regretfully the handle of his keen Chris. A woman's revenge, that. Better the old days when the Chris nudged the white man sharply if he dared tamper with our women. However, it shall be as thou would have it, ornament of all Java. Then do we go and begin life together. Farewell, Prince Yusuf of Jogya, Salam, Desaman rice-grower of the Prianger. But for thee, my beauty, I will attend now to the matter of the pearls." He took them back, kissed her hand fervently, and was gone in the darkness. The residence clock was striking ten when Nana stood before the dark stone shrine, one of those relics of ancient Hindu days in Java, with which the Sultan's gardens were filled. Shrubbery hid it in a maze of foliage, a great clump of blue bamboo hung over it, and half hid the stone godling peering out at her from a niche above. Nana shuddered as she glanced within its dark depths. There were the mats and pillows, spread out as usual by her father's retainers. Here had been made many sacrifices for golden florins, but this was the last, and it was to end in a manner particularly satisfying to her. To humiliate the white beast, a feeble return, but a return just the same for the humiliations she had endured. Why could they not let a dancer be a dancer and enjoy her art alone? Nana lay down inside the shrine, which once had held one of the elder gods, and lounged carelessly, a pillow under her bare brown arm, a cigarette at her lips. Her bare rounded knee jutted out provocatively from a fold of her sarong. She wished this thing over with quickly, for Prince Yusuf was hidden somewhere near with four strong coolies. A faint crunch on the gravel path, a tall form approached, clad in tropical whites, with the upstanding military collar of a white blouse. Faint glint of pearl buttons in the firefly gleams, and the starlight, the red glow of a cigarette tip, but this white man did not at once seat himself on the edge of the mat and begin making love. Instead, he sat himself down cross-legged on the gravel outside, his topi taken off, his head with the sheen of well-groomed hair on it, just visible under the stars to Nana as he smoked in reflective puffs of his cigarette. "'I know you, dancer girl,' he began at last in fluent melee. "'You are Nana Kuching of the court. I saw you dance there, at the last big entertainment the Sultan gave. 
Why, then, do you do this? His tone seemed gently reproving, reproachful. It was the first word spoken to her by a white twan with the least hint of human kindness in it. Nana listened with awakened interest. Strange talk, this. Didst thou note the musician to my left this afternoon, O Tuan, the little monkey man with eyes like an ape who played the bamboo lyre? She inquired. I saw a dancer girl. He managed this, but why? Thou art but a child, Nana, a little graceful child. This that thou doest is for women. He is my father, Tuan. There are many beatings, if I only dance as my soul would. For pity, I thought as much. Therefore that I come here, Nana. Why dost thou not abandon this, and marry a youth of thine own people? Is it money? Is it a dot? So Nana heard his kindly tones, yet she had got up and now sat on the edge of her mat, his eyes glinting with a growing admiration for the physical perfections of her. His cigarette tip was glowing frequently, inhalations under the spell of awakening passion. Nana recognized the symptoms and her heart hardened. Still, if it pleased the white twan to talk kindly, she would listen on. Perhaps he would not lose control, in spite of himself, and go away blameless to be spared. Nay, it is not the money, nor law, nor white twan, she answered. I love one. Thou knowest him? The Prince Yusuf Sengang. I've seen him, sniffed the young white tuan, another child. Nay, it is but our faces that are young, we Javanese. I am a woman, see? exclaimed Nana, artlessly exposing her tiny breasts. The white tuan eyed her avidly. He leaned over, beginning to caress her tentatively. Why, then, do ye not marry? he asked, his voice quivering with the sensations that were rising within him. Nana stifled a laugh. Why was it that her slender little body seemed to excite a flame of desire in all men? This tuan meant well, perhaps, but his feelings were becoming too strong for him. "'Because the sultan will not permit him,' she answered, drawing away from him gently. "'Perhaps he wishes me for a concubine himself. Perhaps he knows secretly of this that my father makes me do. Yusuf is dependent on him alone. Thou knowest, Tuan, we Javanese are poor but proud. It is long to wait. Thou shalt have him, Nana. I too have influence with the sultan. A word in his ear might avail much.' he declared confidently, yet his caresses had become still more fervent. "'Couldst thou?' Nana had thrown herself back on the pillows, her bare arms crossed behind the sleek little knot of black hair ornamented with the spreading filaments of an aigret. She did not seem to realize how unconsciously alluring she was, in her graceful and girlish bare shoulders, in the clinging silks which followed closely the delicate lines of her figure, in her gorgeous brown eyes that were looking tenderly upon this strangely compassionate white tuan. But she felt that he was fast losing that stern and somewhat aloof resolution with which he had come here. The tension had become electric between them. The infinitely enticing, in such a virginal figure of a woman as this, would soon beget an outburst of human passion, sweeping all his fine words, all his noble intentions away. But it was characteristic of the hypocritical white men to talk the nobler the more guilty their thoughts, Nana knew. Child, child, to think that thou art old enough to be married, he gloated, caressing her yet more. But I shall help, and if it is money, he dug into his pocket while Nana heard the crisp rustle of a ten florin note. Bah, it is nothing, he ejaculated vexedly. All I have with me, but there is more, much more, if it'll help. The rustle of that note had awakened the savage in Nana. This was what he had brought, for another purpose. The white twan was simply lying. They all lied. Only this was a new set of lies. She made no move to take the florins, for she was Nana of the Elder Gods now, and this was a bad man-child who needed whipping. Should she listen him out? Let him play out his futile, if well-intentioned, farce. His real desires would soon enough break out. He was trying to fondle and pet her now, all the same time talking nobly, unmindful of her disdainful reluctance. 
Yes, I shall help. I'll speak to the sultan and you shall have your prince. But, oh, what's the use? Nana, Nana, little girl, just once, for me. He broke down, thrusting the note into her hand, pleading, begging, consciousless, utterly unmindful of anything now but her, her, her. His arm swept around her slender waist. His lips sought her shrinking face. It had come, the lamentable truth. Few, hypocrite that talks kindly, but art no better than the rest of them. Jaga! Nana repulsed him disgustedly. There was a swift rush in the bushes. Then that white man seemed to melt away backward. The white body of him was swept kicking around the shrine, horizontally between four dark and struggling coolies. He cursed once or twice, but brown hands stopped his outcry. Nana sprang out of the shrine, for the gleam of a kris had caught her eye. "'No, Yusuf, no!' she hissed, grabbing his arm. The Tuan meant well, doubtless, but he was too much for himself. He has done no evil. Come!" Taking his hand, Nana ran swiftly out of the garden. Behind them they heard a resounding splash, but no outcry. The four coolies had hurled that white man unceremoniously into the sultan's lily pond. It was a squidgy place, of vile and bottomless mud under the Victoria Reggie lilies. Men sent in there to gather lotus blossoms floundered for hours in the slimy ooze of the bottom before reaching shore. The white man would not dare cry out for help. His dignity forbade that. He would get out of that pond alone and in silence, and sneak to his hotel, a loathsome thing of slime and mud. Nana chuckled softly. A woman's revenge, my lord, she murmured to Yusuf as they fled. The latter shook his head. The Chris, if you asked him. But the whole grove seemed to whisper with the laughter of elder gods as Nana and Yusuf left the garden and set their faces towards life. The End Man, oh man, am I right that there's a lot going on that's extremely interesting with this story? We've got a kind of historical reckoning between different faiths of a region. We've got the solution of violence that the prince wants to enact and humiliation, which Nana wants to enact. We've got a relatively sympathetic man who understands, this is Prince Yusuf, who understands what Nana has to do because of the despicable person that her father is. And we also have a really unflinching look at the hypocrisy and despicable nature of colonial relations. I appreciate that what could be a white savior figure in the Tuan who she ends up humiliating is shown to be just as full of shit as everybody else. The exact line is something like, the nobler their speech, the guiltier their thoughts. Man, if that doesn't resonate. So I realize that this is uh, definitely a dark story dealing with gruesome themes, but historical ones. And I think it's handled deftly. I was surprised when I read this one at how much her, how much Nana's decisions really matter and how despicable most of the men are around her. I think this story is ahead of its time, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope it didn't, you know, elicit any uh, untoward responses in you. Anyways, this is Thrilling Suspense Fantasy. The reason that it's called Thrilling Suspense Fantasy is because my magazine is called Thrilling Suspense Fantasy, and if you like what I'm doing here, do me a solid. Buy copies of Thrilling Suspense Fantasy. The links are available in the description below. As always, like, comment, and subscribe. May the rest of your day be excellent.